Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. I uh, get asked about what are the principles of the New Testament about stewardship. And tonight we come to a passage that I believe is the definitive passage on New Testament giving. Now, when I say giving, you automatically think about giving money, but I'm talking about much, much more. I'm talking about giving yourself. Now, I've talked to you through the years about the importance of interpreting the Bible in literary context. And if you miss that, you're going to miss quite a lot of the truth. Chapters 8 and 9 of 2 Corinthians form one literary context. Really, they are amplifications on the same theme using the same basic truths about stewardship. Paul never mentions tithing. Did you know that? Now, Jesus does a couple of times in relation to the Pharisees, but Paul never does. So here we have the New Testament guidelines for giving. Now, with your outline tonight, I would like to go over points 1, 2, and 3, if I might, because I think it'll set the stage for our verse-by-verse verse through 8 and 9. I want to look first at Paul's overall argument concerning Christian giving found in these two chapters. Let's look at that. Now, Paul liked a little uh, healthy competition, and what he's going to say is, why, that church over there in Macedonia is just doing so wonderful. They're doing a lot better than you. Wouldn't you like to beat them? <laughs> we ever do that? We do it in sports all the time. And, and so this is the idea of Paul using another church to encourage them, the Macedonians, one through five. He gives the example of Jesus Christ himself. No greater example of what it means about stewardship of life than Jesus Christ. Then he mentions that they had already started this earlier. 1 Corinthians 16, about 1 through 4, they'd already started this, but kind of gone downhill with other priorities. Next, their encouragement to put their desire into action. He said, y'all wanted to do it, now it's time to get on with it. And then finally, giving equals out. As you give to them, they're going to be giving to you. Now, probably not in an offering, but in prayers and love and support. You see, I think Paul's genius was that he wanted the Gentile church and the Jewish church to be somehow linked together in fellowship and cooperation. This was a good way to do it. Number two, New Testament guidelines for Christian giving found in 89. The first was the basic argument. Now the principles of the two chapters. And these are so good. I, I hope you'll uh, check your own stewardship by these. It needs to be joyous and genuine. Verse two. They gave to the utmost of their ability, verse 3. They gave sacrificially beyond their ability, verse 3 and 12. They gave freely, verse 3. They gave sincerely, verse 4. And they gave themselves, not just their money. Now, quickly on number 3, before I get into text, I want to give you the general background for this. This was not Paul's idea. He is not the first one to think about this offering. That great missionary-minded church, that progressive outreach church at Antioch of Syria is the church that started it. And you see it there in Acts chapter 11, verse 27 through 30. And I think that's where Paul got the idea, and I think he picked up on that right there. Now, he started mentioning it in one of his very earliest letters. There's been some debate among uh, New Testament scholars as to what the first book written of the New Testament is. Most, most would pick Galatians or 1 Thessalonians as the very first written correspondence of Paul. So we're talking about very early in Paul's ministry. If you look at the Galatian letter there, he began to talk about this love offering for the poor saints of the mother church in Jerusalem. And then he had talked about it in Corinth before. It's not something new to them. You see that in chapter, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. That's the background to the chapter we're in now. Now, if you've been following through with us, you know there's a radical mood break between chapter 7 and chapter 8. 
It's like he's just saying, I, I finished that discussion and I'm going to begin a brand new discussion. And it's a totally different content, totally different atmosphere. And so Paul begins. Now, I'm going to tell you, brothers, of God's... Now, do you have the word grace in your Bible? God's grace? The word grace is used ten times in these two chapters. Now, here it obviously refers to the undeserved, unmerited love of God. But, but... In this chapter, its primary use is not that theological sense, but the sense of the gracious, freely given offering. And you can see that down in verse 6. You can see it in verse 7. You can see it in uh, verse 19. All through here, it talks about the gracious offering. So it's a a non-theological sense most of the time. Which was given in the churches of Macedonia. Now, what churches are we talking about? Who, what are the Macedonian churches? Name one of them. Philippi. Berea. Thessalonica. Those are the three we know about, okay? And uh, they're just to the north of Achaia, where Corinth and Athens are in. And they've got a little uh, loving competition going here between these Greek cities. Now, because in spite of the terrible... Now, I want you to notice the paradox of this verse... And then I want you to know the power of this verse in your life. Because in spite of the terrible test of trouble, the mighty flood of their gladness mingled with the depths of their poverty has overflowed and resulted in the abundance of their liberality. My soul, what a paradox. Did you ever think that an overflow of abundance could could come from poverty and that joy could come out of a severe test? Friends, that's what the Christian life is all about. He changes circumstances because he changes people's attitude within circumstances. Now, sometimes he changes circumstances. Quite often he does not. He changes people in circumstances. You can see some of this problem, a little bit of what this persecution or test was, from the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, 6, and chapter 2, 14. There was a persecution occurring in these churches. They were poor churches to start out with. They were not rich. They were poor churches. They didn't have enough for their own selves their own congregation, but they gave willingly, freely, and joyfully to another church that needed help. Now, when that happens, you know Jesus is somewhere in that system. Don't you believe that? Now, the word test is used here, and I want you to look in your translation for the word test. Now, there are two words in Greek for test. Sometimes they're translated test or tempt, or try. One of them is always used of man and of the devil, and it's a metallurgy term, both of them are, but one of them is used in such a way that it comes to mean to test with a view toward destruction, or trying to trick somebody for their hurt, or tempt them for their demise. But there's another word for test, used of God primarily. That is a metallurgy term to put ore under the crucible of heat to separate the dross from the metal. But it is used throughout the New Testament for to test with a view toward approval. And that's what's used of God. When it says God tempts no one, it's that word toward destruction. But when Jesus prays, lead us not into temptation... That's the view toward destruction. The Bible says God doesn't tempt anybody. But friends, all over the Bible it said God tested Abraham. And on and on. God does not test us for our destruction, but God will test us for our strength. Tempered steel is steel that is put under a strain to make it stronger. Christians are put under a strain to make them stronger. Now remember that next time you get between a rock and a hard place, would you? A test of their trouble. This word is used here in verse 2. It's the same word is used in verse 8. The same word is used in verse 22. And the same word is used in chapter 9, 13. Okay? Notice this mighty flood. A a little more literal be an abundance of joy. Wow. Mingled with the depths of their poverty. And this is a very strong word in Greek. They are poor folks. They're poor folks. They are poor. Poor, poor folks. Okay? Now, the word liberality is a beautiful word. Primarily, it meant single-mindedness. 
but it came to be used in the sense of genuine. Now here they gave out of their poverty with joy, and they gave with a sincere, single-minded purpose. Now those are two principles of giving. Joy and single-minded purposefulness in what you give. Those are two principles of giving. Joy, liberality, single-minded purpose. Now, let me continue. For they have given, and I can testify, to the utmost of their ability. They gave all that they had. They gave all that they could spare. There was no more abundance out of which to give. That's a principle of spiritual giving. Look at the fourth one. They didn't cut it to the bone. They took part of the bone. They didn't take the fat out. They took part of the muscle. They gave beyond their ability. Now, Paul didn't promise many things. He didn't say, if you give, I'll, the Lord will make you rich and stop your persecution. They gave because they loved. And they gave to a sister church, listen to me now, that wasn't real sure they were kosher. Right? Right? Wasn't real sure they were fully in. This church gave out of that kind of a church, out of that kind of a spirit, to that kind of a church. Notice it says, they gave their own accord. Stewardship is always voluntary in the Christian faith. There is never someone on your back saying, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? No. Voluntary. Next, with earnest entreaty, they kept on begging me for the favor of sharing in this service. Well, it's been a long time since somebody said, would you please take my money? I just want to get, would you please take my money for that? Well, I haven't been tracked down a long time more like that. Have you? <laughs> These folks were excited about participating in the ministry of God through Paul to this church in Jerusalem. And they said, please, please let us help. The word sharing is the word koinonia. You've heard that before. It means joint participation in. They believed that by sharing their resources, they were sharing in the work of God in the church of Jerusalem. I want to tell you, when you help the causes of Christ, you are a participator in those causes with, him, with, the, with whoever's doing it. Isn't that exciting? That you can be a part of something so far away and yet intricately involved in what's happening for the Lord? That's exciting. He continues in. This is where it's uh, being rendered to God's people. That's the word saints. And I want to say again to you, I've said it so often, the word saint is from the root, same root as sanctuary, sanctified, holy, same root, saint, sanctified ones, holy ones. Now in the Old Testament, it meant someone or something or some place called out for the special purpose of God. In the New Testament, it does not refer to our godliness, it refers to our position in Jesus Christ. It is positional sanctification. Now, I also want you to notice the word never appears in the singular except one time in Philippians in a corporate context. It is impossible to be a Lone Ranger Christian. To be a Christian is to be a part of a community. To be saved is to be a part of a family. We are together in this thing around the world. There is no isolated body or fellowship of Christians. All who are truly Christians are a part of the same body and the same family. Hallelujah. It continues then when it says, they did, not, they did not do as I expected, but even more. Paul was surprised. They first, by God's will, gave themselves to the Lord and then to me. Now, I'm into what I think stewardship's all about. I think there must be a nerve that connects the heart to the pocketbook. And that is one strong nerve. Is that right? It really is, friend. You know, you can talk about Jesus all you want to, just leave my money alone is, is an attitude of many people. I want to say to you that our attitude about giving is a thermometer of who we are in the Lord. You say, you mean how much I give? Woo, you can read a whole lot in here quick, can't you? You see, I'm not even talking about money at this point. I'm talking about stewardship, which is an understanding that all that we are and all that we have belongs to God, and we are merely spiritual managers of physical and spiritual resources and time. 
Now, it, you can real easy find out where your priority structure. Now, you can rationalize why you give what you give, and I, I never look, and I never will. But I want you to know there is somebody who does look. You say, Randy. No. <laughs> the Lord Jesus. Aren't you glad I put that in? And brothers and sisters, he's not looking at the amount, he's looking at the heart. And he's not looking at the financial record, he's looking at the life. And he wants to know if you love him. And if you love him, it's going to be more than lip service. You're going to be out there in his name giving water, clothing the naked, visiting the sick, being in the hospitals, being in the prisons in his name. That's what the great white throne judgment is all about in Matthew 25, 31 and following, right? I don't see anywhere where it says the book were open and their financial record was checked. But I do see where on great, the gray of judgment, Jesus says, what have you been doing with your life and your resources for me? Now, lest you take what I'm saying wrong, you will never make heaven by giving everything you have and everything you are to Jesus, right? Revelation 20, when the books were opened, the book of life contains the names of those who have trusted Jesus. But because your names in the book of life means that your life is going to be changed and impacted by love, not only for God, but for men. So I think the stewardship here is a stewardship primarily of self. And when God's got you, he's got everything that you are. What God wants is not any part of your life. God wants the whole of who you are, who you can be, and your dreams and plans and goals. God wants you. He wants you. Now, so that I insisted that Titus, as he had formerly commenced it, should bring to completion this gracious contribution. There's that word again, back to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 through 4. Yes, just as you are growing rich. Now here, boy, you could do a proof text sermon right there. If you give, you'll grow rich. I've heard that so much I could throw up over that. Does this sound biblical to you? You give a dollar, God will give you ten dollars back. Now, you know what amazes me? God does that. (laughs) God will do that. But the attitude of the giver determines the quality of the blessing. If you're given to get, you won't get much blessing. If you're given because you love Jesus and what he stands for and you love people because he's changed your life, he'll fill you up with everything you can handle. You might notice the list that follows have nothing to do with material things. Lo and behold. You mean there's a blessing beyond material things? I think modern America needs to hear that there's a blessing beyond material things. There's something beyond it. All those things we're striving to get. Now, he lists them. Faith, expression, knowledge, perfect enthusiasm, love, and this gracious contribution also. I am not saying this by spirit of command. The spirit of command in the area of stewardship is never appropriate. Never appropriate. Never appropriate. Never appropriate. You never give because you're told to. You give out of a broken heart overflowing with the love of God that saved a wretch like you. Then it continues... But I am simply trying to test the genuineness of your love. There's that word for test again. Uh, By the enthusiasm for others. Do you think it's a fair test that we can truly know how much we love Jesus by how we treat others? That sounds plumb biblical to me. Just sounds plumb biblical to me. They will know that you're my disciples by the way that you love one another. Paul continues. For by experience you know the unmerited favor, there's the word grace in a theological sense, the unmerited favor shown by our Lord Jesus Christ. The word Lord is emphasis on his deity. The word Christ is emphasis on his title as Messiah. And the word Jesus is an emphasis on his humanity used by the New Testament writers when that full fold of God, man, Messiah. That although he was rich, now what does that mean? Well, you know that Jesus, the man, the carpenter of Nazareth, never had wealth. This is talking about the pre-existent glory. 
Man, you think rubies and diamonds or something. You wait till you see Jesus the way he was before he came to earth in that manger. Woo-hoo! You talk about splendor. You talk about marvelous. You talk about, yeah, I can't behold it. We can't even see it to be made like him. Blind all of us. Jesus left the perfect splendor of heaven, the fullness of deity, the fellowship of eternity, and was put in the womb of a peasant woman and born in a cattle feeding trough in the city of David. Left it all to come and be a man. Now that's what stewardship is all about. That's what stewardship is all about. Though he was rich. Why don't you put down John 1, 1 and following. On a real good one. Just ring, ring the bells of heaven. Is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Whew. Though he was rich, for your sakes he became poor. Now, Paul says something interesting here. Now, I give you my opinion. Well, verse 10. Paul does that two other times. He does it in 1 Corinthians 7, 25 and 40. Let me ask you a question. If Paul, an inspired writer, says, I'm not giving you what the Lord told me, but I'm giving you my opinion on it, is that inspired? Woo, tough question, isn't it? Because the thing he's talking about is about uh, divorce in 1 Corinthians 7. And here it's about incarnation and stewardship. Well, let me give you my opinion. That's a difficult question. I don't know if we can answer it for certain because the Bible doesn't answer it. I would say this, because of my presupposition that the Bible is the self-revelation of God inspired by His Holy Spirit, even though Paul didn't know uh, he was inspired, I think he was. And when he wrote it in the book, to me it became authoritative. That's just my opinion. Paul never dreamed that we'd pour over his words, word by word, you know, and collect his books and all that. His opinion meant quite a bit, quite a bit to us, hadn't it? And he goes on to tell them about, you know, he's looking for their interest and uh, about their first beginning and all that. He says, I'm not going to command you, but in verse 11 he throws in an imperative. I guess he was a preacher after all, wasn't he? <laughs> Look at verse 12. That's a good one. If a man is really willing to give, his gift is acceptable in accordance with what he has, not with what he does not have. What that saying is not a man, it's attitude. You might want to put Mark 12, 41 through 44, the widow's might. Jesus sitting across from those trumpet-shaped containers in the court of the women, and in which those men were... And you know, the Jews were real creative. If you're going to give $10, if you give it all in quarters, it really sounds a lot. Right? It makes a real nice noise ringing down those coffers. Jesus watched those men come by and give large sums of money. But he watched that little widow come. And all she had was a half a penny. Two of them. Well, she should have put one in and kept one, right? Put both of them in. Friends, that's stewardship. Let me continue then. When he goes on to talk about the Scripture says in verse 15, and he's going to quote Exodus 16, 18, which is the gathering of manna. They never had too little. They never had too much. Isn't that what the Sermon on the Mount is talking about? That God will provide our needs if we seek Him and His righteousness first? All of our needs? That's the promise. Problem is, we got a lot more wants than we got needs. I'm not sure He's going to spoil us by all our wants, but He will provide our needs. Now, but thanks be to God who kindles in the heart of Titus. Did you know Titus? He was the guy that got the Corinthian church straightened out when Timothy just fell on his face. He's the guy that Paul left in Crete. And Crete was the pits of a place to be left at. Well, those Cretans were rough. Titus got the Cretan church on its feet. Titus is Paul's missionary companion. Titus helped take the money to Jerusalem. Titus is the one they accused of him taking the temple that caused the riot. Titus is never mentioned once in the book of Acts. Isn't that unusual? You say, why? I have no idea. Never mentioned once in the whole book of Acts. Now... This seems to be, verse 60 and following, a letter of recommendation to the church for, for Titus. Now, if you want to see about that, go back to chapter 3, verse 1, and you'll see about the letter of recommendation as Paul talks about them. 
Never mentioned in the book of Acts, Titus is. Now, look at verse 18. I'm sending with him a well-known brother whose praise for spreading the good news is ringing throughout all the churches. Well, why didn't he name him? I don't know. I guess it magnifies who Titus is. We've got another brother mentioned down in verse 22. Now, I'm not sure we got one extra companion or two extra companions. There's been a lot of speculation on who this is. Uh, most tradition says it may be Luke, the beloved physician. I don't know. I just know that Paul was a wise old owl. Everybody was on his case for cheating, preaching for money, taking advantage. Paul says, I'm going to take me and I'm going to take Titus and I'm going to take a representation from every church and because I don't trust you much, cause I'm going to take two from your group. <laughs> Man, he wanted everything above board, so far above board, nobody could criticize him because he was criticized. You might want to see chapter 11, verse 9 and 12 where Paul just was really sensitive about this deal about money. For many had attacked him over it. Now, uh, notice it says, not only that, but he has been selected by the churches to travel with me. Notice the congregational polity of several churches. The churches picked the man to go. Um, look at verse 20. And I am arranging it. This word arranging is an interesting word. You might want to underline it. It is a nautical message, a nautical word for making special care with the sails when approaching the dock of a ship. Uh, think about that. He, he is taking meticulous care in how he does that. That's the idea here. So that no one can blame me in this matter of the bountiful fund that has been, uh, is being handled by me. For I am not taking the precaution to do what is right, not only in the sight of, of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. Now, I want to I give you three quotes here, four quotes. This, I think, is a, is a quote from Proverbs 3, 4. But if you turn your Old Testament, you won't see it there. It's in the Septuagint of Proverbs 3, 4, which changes it slightly from the Masoretic text. What he's saying is that we as Christians must flee from every appearance of evil. Not just evil, but the appearance of evil. You want to write these down, I'm sure. Matthew 10, 16. 2 Corinthians 6, 3, 1 Thessalonians 5, 22, and 1 Timothy 3, 7. We must flee from every appearance of evil, especially to outsiders. Now, verse 22, the new brother is mentioned. I think it's a second brother. Um, notice the word tested there in verse 22 again. And finally, in verse 23, As for Titus, he is my partner and comrade in the work for you. While these brothers of ire... Look at the word there in verse 23. The representatives of the churches. This is the term apostle. This is the wider use of the term. Remember about one of the twelve that walked with Jesus. For very quickly, this term was widened into other servants. Silas and Barnabas are called apostles. But this is referring to uh, official representatives of the church is what it's talking about. And... Uh, that's unusual use of that term we're not used to. We'll bring glory to Christ so that you must furnish them before all the churches proof of your love and ground for my praising you so highly. And next week we'll cover chapter 9, which is the same basic argument but from a different perspective and I think is very, very helpful.